Hello, um, I'm Joan Lipkin and I am an independent artist and the artistic director of that uppity theater company. I am also the proud chair of the ATHA Committee for Community-Based Theater and Civic Engagement Award. And so I have many reasons to be excited to be talking today with Larissa Fasthorse and Ty Defoe of Indigenous Direction. Welcome to both of you. Um, I thought that maybe we should start with our pronouns and also do a land acknowledgement, if that is okay with you. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am talking to you via Zoom from um, the uh, original home of the Osage, Miami, Sioux, and Iroquois, also known now as the area called St. Louis. Ty? Yes, Bujun in the way Namaganug, Ty in the Jinakaz Nishmani Tawag, Waswaganin in Dunjipa, Nikizin in Dodem, Ty and Defoe, and my pronouns are, well, it's just Ty. Um, Nishmani Tawag, so you can also, my pronouns could be he, or also we, or just Thai. Um, I am currently dialed in here from uh, Lenape Kohing and Matahata of the, um, the Lenape Nations people, um, but specifically the Canarsi over here in Brooklyn. So that's where I'm dialing in from, and I have this beautiful tapestry of Anishinaabe beadwork behind me caring with my ancestors and uh, the futures there in the stars. Beautiful. Larissa? Hi, honey, watch day. Larissa Fastor, I'm a member of the Sachangu Lakota Nation. I am currently um, calling in from Santa Monica, California, which is the home of the um, Shumash Tongva, kind of a, a gathering area. Shumash Tongva, Gabrielino Tongva, Keech, did I say Tongva? Yes. Um, a lot of different folks are in this area and traveled in and out of this region along the coast. And so that's where I am right now. Very good. And I think something that I think is wonderful is that we have now begun to understand that doing pronouns and land acknowledgements is really important, right? And that's, I think, is, is a recent shift in our culture. And I hope it's one that more companies and individuals can, uh, can embrace. So I'd like to talk with you briefly about your personal histories, um, then about your work together as a company. I read that both of you had early dance experience. Larissa, you were a ballet dancer and Ty, you were doing hoop dancing. Um, and, I think, and I think you still are. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences to move into theater uh, in, in a different sense? As, as a performer, as, as an artist, Larissa, and then Ty? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't say my pronouns. I'm busy, I was busy typing in my pronoun on my name, and I did, so I didn't say it, but it, uh, there's she, her. Um, so yeah, I started in classical ballet, um, coming out a pretty rare Native American ballet dancer from South Dakota, um, and I uh, have a play I'm doing with Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis about that, and so you can see what that journey was. Um, but yeah, going from ballet to theater was um, a pretty tough journey, actually. I'm really fortunate that I had Career Transitions for Dancers, which is an organization currently under the Actors Fund that helped me transition because you're so young and you've been doing ballet from such an early age, it's your entire mm -hmm. life. And so they helped me transition and find writing, um, which is something I'd always done on my own, but never in an organized way. And they helped me find script writing because I was living here in Los Angeles. And I actually started, um, you know, when, in my transition, trying to find my space. And I, I was at the um, United Nations in Geneva, um, speaking at the uh, Working Group for Indigenous Populations. And I, I had that moment, that aha moment, where I was talking about accurate representation of Indigenous peoples and, and how we need to portray them and give them the power to do those things. And in that moment, I realized that I had to take responsibility for that power and I needed to um, have that power and be able to change the way Indigenous people are represented. So in that moment, I decided to become a, a full-time writer and, and left performing completely and decided to write full-time. And so I worked first in film and television and then later in theater. So that's how I got here. Right, so you just shared a, a really significant moment that was one of those aha moments. How about you, Ty? Was there, um, was there a mem an early memory or um, a really special moment that moved you into performance that you can share with us? 
Well, you know, that's such a, a fascinating question because I feel as though um, performance and making work in my community and dancing with hoops and things are just what we did in, in at, back home and still do. And I feel like, you know, and as it relates to labels and categorizing things, it's just a different, it's just called something different. So when, you know, I left my community, it, people were calling it, you know, various, you know, forms and were framing it in, in a new kind of way. But when I went back home, and had my aha moment, I think, of figuring out what what exactly it was I was doing. It was I was making theater. I was like telling stories um, by using language, not using language, by using design. And to me, that is theater. It's about bringing and of coming together of people to tell a particular story, to inaugurate a particular moment, to create a milestone so that we can create remembrance. And so I feel like that's something that I was doing at a time as well as you know the people around me and just was using different language to identify it yes thank you and you know i i know that so often in this culture we tend to focus on specializing and a lot of artists are really interdisciplinary and they find many many vocabularies to express what they want right but i did know that for example larissa you were really doing a lot of film writing at one point um and you wrote two films uh, that I'm aware of, The Migrant and um, also A Final Wish. Is that correct? And oh, actually, no, I didn't write either of those. I worked on the, I produced those films, but I didn't. Oh, you produced them. Those were not ones I wrote. Yeah, I wrote a film called Lazarus Rises, as in the Sundance program. And then I had two television series that I had sold, one to um, Nickelodeon and one to Fox, but neither, neither of them ended up on the air. But that's, that is where I started, yes. And so, yeah, so you started, you were doing a lot of film work and either as a producer, or as a writer, and now are you working exclusively in theater or are you using other mediums as well? Yeah, I, so I started out in film and television and I quickly, you know, I sold these two shows really fast and um, they, as all of my, almost all of my work, they both uh, centered Indigenous characters. And at that time, 10 years ago, um, the film and TV industry was not, very um, advanced in the representation of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and in the representation of indigenous cultures and even in casting, you know, red face was still incredibly common 10 years ago, which is, uh, is not that long, but it's surprising how um, prevalent it was. So I was, um, I developed both those shows. Uh, when I got through the processes, I realized that I was relieved when neither of them made it on the air. And that uh, was jarring. I was like, I don't want to spend my life creating work that I'm happy didn't happen. That's horrible. But it was just such a battle to constantly try to um, get the studios to, you know, portray the, the cultures accurately, portray the um, actors accurately, etc. So I, in that time, um, I was working on that script at Sundance and I, the feature script, and I received a call from Peter Brocious at Children's Theatre Company and he commissioned my very first play and I've said this many times, but I'll say it again. You know, I walked into the rehearsal room and I was like, oh, this is Dancers with Furniture. I totally understand this. And so I just felt at home. And so I stayed in theater for the next um, 10 years. And theater has been incredible. Theater was, I, my goal is in being an artist is not just to create art. My goal is to change the world and change the field and change the viewers. Um, I don't do it for myself. I do it to change others. That's my, art is my social justice work. And so, um, when I got into theater, they were willing and excited to change the way they work, to accept the challenges. I give every theater challenge, two challenges, um, that I can't be the only indigenous art in the season. I can't be the only indigenous person paid in the season. And I've done that for my first play through now. And every theater has been thrilled to accept those challenges and take them on and surpass them. And so I found such a willingness in theater to change that I hadn't found in film and television. However, exactly a year ago, um, I went back to film, I was um, approached to return to film and TV. And so far so good. 10 years later is very different. And um, I'm developing two things at NBC, um, one thing at Disney Channel, one at Freeform, and another film pretty soon, most likely at Disney. And so, um, and so far the development process has been amazing and completely different than what 10 years ago and the willingness to be accurate and hire indigenous consultants that 
know that culture is is completely different than it was before. So we'll see what happens when we get to production, but so far in development, it's been really a positive experience. That is so encouraging to hear and to know that there can be progress, this kind of progress within, but wow, you were so busy. It's, it's uh, thank you for making this time to be with us today. I know a lot of people are going to appreciate hearing what you have to say. Todd, um, you received a Grammy <laughs> for a album that you produced of Native American music, as I understand. That's mm -hmm. exciting. And I know also that you're a wonderful composer and lyricist. Are you doing, continuing to do work um, in that area? I am, absolutely. All the pots are being stirred, Joan. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, you know, I, I want to talk to you so much about your individual work, but I sort of feel that we should move along because we, we have brief time. And so my question to you is, what kinds of indigenous cultural protocols and, and guides are you suggesting for um, for theater and, and maybe also for film, but let's focus on theater because this is APA. Larissa? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny because we've been talking to a lot of people now that we're in the big pause um, about how things are different. And um, one of the things that has always been um, at the center, the core of what we do with indigenous uh, communities and organizations is just listening is spending a lot of time listening. And this is a perfect time in this pause for folks to listen. I mean, that's the easiest step. And um, we keep telling people, it's really simple. You just have to ask the indigenous people what they want and then listen. Um, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but that, that is really the basis of our work and, and what we tell people to do. And now when we're not producing things, you're not running to rehearsal and you're not running to read throughs, is a great time to start really deeply listening. Mm -hmm. We don't... Yeah. Do we? Ty, did you want to add something to that before we move on to another question? Yeah, yeah. Other things we sort of been, you know, talking about is about, you know, the process at which you are engaging the communities, which becomes extremely important, you know, rather than window dressing things on the stage. It's like allowing people to reflect and look at process and look at some of the systems and maybe changing the system at which you're approaching Native or Indigenous communities being extremely important. And oftentimes that evolves around um, like the invitation, the invitation to continually to adjust how you are interacting with the community, which is really extremely important. So yes, would you say, it sounded like at least in the film industry, Larissa, that there's been a lot of progress and that some of the companies that you're working with in the US have been very open to you. But I'm wondering if you can sort of address the issue of progress in the theater um, with regard to inclusion of indigenous people um, appropriately and appropriate representation um, in, in the narrative and, and in the general programming. Because from where I sit, it doesn't seem like there's enough there's never enough, right? It doesn't seem like very much. Um, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, it, it's totally true. It's funny because, you know, I say like, oh my goodness, the field has changed so much since I got into it. Um, my first play I started was actually 13 years ago and I was just finishing my CTV career. And, um, you know, there were years where I was the only Lort commissioned Native American playwright in the country. Like there are many years and that was horrifying. And so, you know, we've been, um, both individually and together. Ty and I have been together since my very second play when, um, you know, as far as working together in theater. And, um, and so we, uh, through all of this, have had a really concerted <laughs> effort to both educate, the American theater just had to be made aware, actually, in the beginning that there weren't any Indians around, <laughs> which is crazy, but it was true. They were just like, oh, right, huh, we have never, like every single time I was I've had a play premiered at a theater company. I have always been the first one. It's always been the first Native American playwright, always been the first Native American written words. Um, when Ty and I, as Indigenous Direction, um, did our first project for the Guthrie Theater, the very first, that was when the very first Indigenous written words had ever been spoken on a Guthrie stage in 50 years. I mean, it's 
incredible that that's, that's what's happening now. However, it's happening. Um, is it enough? Absolutely not. We're, we're not even 1% of theater artists. Like they can't, they have to call us, you know, an other or whatever, because we don't even equal a, a piece of a percent percentage of the theater that's made in America. Um, they can't even count it. It's so small. <laughs> you know? So clearly we have a long way to go. But people, you know, I'm really excited for um, folks like Ty, who are from genera another generation younger than myself, who are, he's such a multidisciplinary artist in a way that I was not, I am not, and I'm just kind of learning from him to be, um, because he, he does such an incredible job of weaving so many different things. And I think um, he's found so many places for indigenous artists in, in the, you know, Western theater format that I didn't even realize existed because he can morph into so many different things. He is a shapeshifter, but he also does it as a person, but he also does it in his work that he can morph into so many different spaces that I didn't even know were possible for us to be in. And I'm constantly inspired by that. Yeah, that's fantastic. So important that we're sharing this information. Ty, did you want to yeah. add something to that um, about where you feel the status is of a contemporary American theater with regard to our indigenous uh, folks? Yeah, you know, I think that we are beginning to scratch the surface, you know, as it relates to that, because we even call American, right, theater, American theater, and what does that mean in terms of operating with a native or indigenous lens, right? The word American often is throw out who you are to become something else, or in this case, throw out who you are to become solely Eurocentric, right? in this kind of way where it was invented. But I think by looking in and sort of contesting this word um, American theater, I think we're looking at things with not only a, a decolonized lens, but also like an indigenous one at the same time, depending on who you are and where you're located to get right down to the specificity of um, you know tribal entities, of citizens of our sovereign land here in Turtle Island, which becomes extremely, extremely important because that also, in our conversations that we have, Larissa and I, when we go around to different communities and, and are engaging with different people, we're able to get the nuance and the detail of the land, just the how the land acknowledgement sort of has taken off in the past, you know, year or two years for non-Indigenous folks, which is, becomes important. But what is um, looking ahead and imagining the future, what is the next step of that, right? So I think that's also something that's really important to continue to evolve to know that um, it's not business as usual and to know that language and the way that we are creating these systems need to involve and, and evolve to include native indigenous people because of the genocide that happened with bodies and currently then the genocide that's happening on paper with this paper genocide, right? So it's really, really important that we can continue every year to evaluate how we're viewing and including native people in, in processes and on stages uh, in the theater. And that goes for folks who are, you know, um, I think, you know, the spectrum of wokeness who are so woke, it's like there's, there's work to be done on all levels to include us because this is our home, right? Our ancestors have lived here for so long. And when we're doing work and we're creating work, we are thinking about the seven generations beyond the lifetime at which we know. So seven generations ahead. And we're trying to ensure the cultural bed for those future generations so they can make theater. And that's something we're also continuing to talk about. Wow, that's fantastic. And maybe this will be our final question, although I wish that we could spend much time. I want to respect your time. Um, but speaking of business not being as usual, right? Um, given the recent powerful statement and movement, um, uh, we see you white American theater, right? I'm, that has taken place and, and was launched earlier this summer. I'm wondering, um, if you have a few pointers that well-intentioned allies in semi, in, in various states of wokeness, right? Um, uh, what is it that, that they need to know and do? And what can they really implement to try and, and create a more equitable um, and respectful 
um, society and artistic community? What would, what would you suggest? So many things. <laughs> it's, uh, it's big, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we did, we have uh, been, as Indigenous Direction, we've certainly been a, a, a large part of the movement in the United States of doing a land acknowledgement. Um, we contributed to a lot of different documents and programs in that way. And, and it's funny because people, you know, it's how quickly we get backlash. But um, it, it's, mm -hmm shocking to me how many people still can't acknowledge the land they're on because they still don't know who the people are so um it's a it's only a step it's a very first baby step that you should know on whose land you are standing at all times wherever you go because you're always traveling right now i'm on someone else's in someone else's nation um you you don't just show up in you know france and not know wonder where you not know what country you're in and not even care <laughs> and not learn basic words in that language. Um, you have to show up in, in these countries, these sovereign nations, and know where you're standing. It's just, it doesn't make sense not to know that. So, you know, we've been a, a, a big proponent of land acknowledgement. We continue to be, even though we also are very clear, as Ty was just saying earlier, it's a step. It's, it's one very first baby step, but then there's so many steps after that in um, how you engage with indigenous folks and um, how you seek out people. We, we constantly though, I'm thinking a lot about our work we've been doing with the Guthrie because we've been there for quite a few years now and they, they're continuing to deepen their work and understanding what we talk about is being of service. Being, we don't say, what can you get from a community? How can I engage with community? We don't use any of those words. We say, how can I be of service? To this community because what we're honestly talking about the scary word is reparations so there should be there, every theater company in this country is profiting off of stolen land so they need to somehow figure out how to start paying that back reparations for some reason is a word that scares people so we use being of service how can you be of service to your indigenous community and listen and find out those ways and it's and again it's different for every space but if you find you know, find your indigenous, first be able to name your indigenous people, find your indigenous people, show up, go to them and ask, you know, here are the resources we have. How can we be of service to you with these resources? Are any of them of interest to you? And see what comes up. It's amazing. I had an incredible experience with um, Cincinnati Playhouse uh, where they've now had this incredible <laughs> long-term uh, relationship with the Greater um, Cincinnati Native American Coalition. And just by asking that, just by hosting a dinner feeding people, sitting around food, breaking bread together and saying, hey, here are the resources we have. We have space, we have this big lobby that lots of people come to. We have um, a presence in the city in this way and that way. You know, we have all these different things. Are any of them of interest to you? We have a van that we use. You know, are any of these things of interest to you? And, and the, they work together and they continue to deepen and deepen this relationship just by asking that, identifying the local native people asking how to be of service. And the relationship you talk to Blake Robeson, he'll say has been pretty incredible and amazing and, and fruitful for the theater company, far more than you know any other they've had in a long time. So that's where I start, it's pretty simple. It's a start, right? And um, yeah. also be interesting to hear um, perhaps Ty address uh, um, how to work more with, with uh, indigenous performers and arts administrators and designers and technicians so that somebody isn't the only person in the room. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is somebody who's in the room, right? And, oh, and so uh, this excuse that, that, that a lot of regional theaters make about how they don't know who the indigenous actors are. So Ty, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Larissa and I often talk in, in both of our work, the idea about inclusivity, which is extremely important from the person cleaning the floors, the carpets of these theater spaces. Like, you know, it, we, we, you don't know someone until you can humanize them, right, and bring them into the process. And we have found that to work um, so, so much from ushers to front of house staff to people that are pulling the curtain up, if you have a curtain, anymore right so all of these people become extremely extremely important in that great um hoop or that great circle right and that's a design and object that we can constantly and continue to lean into um it's just like the people on the stages but it's also the people that are doing a lot of the work behind the scenes and you know in the marketing departments who have to check over all the um you know the tribal nations on the program that people are going to view out 
right? Those are all spelled so differently. What are the history of those tribal languages and names uh, from the dramaturge that needs to gather information within the community? But first and foremost, I definitely will say and qu uh, quote Larissa Fast Horse and say, um, mm -hmm. it's really, really important to listen right? Listen, and number one, we have um, some indigenous direction protocols that we um, came up with, um, you know, as a, as a company here, and one on the on the top is listen. It's like also asking what are the protocols for being on the land? We say, uh, keep the land intact, don't remove any historical objects or contact the elders, like who are the elders um, of, of the area and then who are stewarding that space? We talk about um, know the, the taboos of the culture and what are those, right? They're different for each sovereign nation. Um, who are the leaders in the community already doing this work? There's, a, you know, if this is all turtle wine, there are people, I guarantee you, organizing, um, you know, within community. We talk a lot um, and just acknowledging the complexities I think of indigeneity and what that encounters, right? People from many different tribal um, identifiers, but also maybe um, mixed with um, black uh, folks or like Latinx folks, right? We're complex individuals. So what is, you know, what is the, the temperament of that and what is the, the landscape of that? And always uh, try to be mindful, right? And note that the cultural differences, I think, that language perceived or emails, written emails or phone calls, ways of communication, the big C for compassion and caring are really important. Like your email might be a way that you communicate, but when you go into a community and or communicating with another native indigenous person, what's the communication, um, you know, the, the grander communication there. So yeah, so there are all kinds of things I think that um, we can glean from a lot of the learnings that we have and those are just a few of them. Thank you so much. Uh, um, thank you for helping us listen at AFTA and helping us hopefully grow and work together. Um, it's, I'm so touched and honored um, to be with you and I'm so moved by your work both individually and collectively. Uh, we think that you are really important, significant theater artists and taking us where we need to go. Uh, and a lot of people are going to be listening and hearing what you have to say. Um, with respect for your time, is there anything you want to add before we close this all too short exchange? <laughs> Continue yeah, with this medium. Yeah, no. Absolutely, Plama Aye, uh, for having us. And it does, it means a huge amount to Ty and I. When we were in that room in 2015, in our little two-person affinity group, like creating our company, um, it, we never imagined we'd be recognized in this way. And it really, it means so much. So uh, thank you for this and thank you for this recognition. Yes, thank you so much. It was, you know, you put your head down, you do the work, you do the hard work. And I think when you get in, in a type of award like this, it just really gives us um, an extra breath, right? It gives us like an extra lift in being and just having that recognition, we're very, very excited about it, so. Well, I know you're so welcome. I know that you are being widely recognized in many circles, but I have to say that when educators recognize artists, we say, wow, then this is gonna, the, the, the wisdom and the gifts of these artists are gonna spread to students and, you know, more generations, so. Uh, to my mind, it's it's a it's a special kind of award, but every award that you get is special. And thank you so much. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Miigwech. Thanks, Larissa. Thanks, Joan. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>